Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 118 of the Gun Blog Variety Cast, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you, Aaron? I am mirthsome. Uh, <laughs> I just saw something on Facebook, and, and I'm going to quote it because it's funny. Quote, As far as I can tell from some quick internet research, there are over a hundred times as many bronies in the U.S. as there are KKK members. But please, media, keep breathlessly informing us what the KKK thinks of everything. End quote. Now, as a hardcore My Little Pony fan, this just has opportunity written all over it. There's a gloriously bad idea somewhere in all of this, and I must ponder it. I don't know what it will be, but I'm thinking it involves bright colors, pony costumes, and pranking the Triple K. <laughs> How are you doing, Sean? My, my big worry about the KKK is that I'm afraid of being around them, because if I ever decide to take a swing at one of them... They're so infiltrated by the FBI that I'm pretty sure that punching one of them is likely to get me arrested for assaulting a federal agent. <laughs> well, if you're going to quote things off of Facebook, I think I'm going to do it too. This is from listener Steven, who put this on the Gunblog Cast page. I'm getting caught up on the Gunblog Cast since I didn't resubscribe to all of the podcasts right away after having to change phones several months ago. But I wanted to say I think you're doing a great job as a full-time co-host, Aaron. I didn't realize what had happened Aww. at first, because the last time I was listening regularly, Adam was the co-host. And at first, I figured you were just filling in while he was on another Jeep misadventure. Aww, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I agree with you. She is doing a fantastic job. And that is absolutely why I said, Aaron, guess what? You get to be the co-host. Too bad. I don't care if you don't want to be the co-host. You are going to be the co-host. No, you will be the co-host. You get no choice in this. <laughs> <sighs> we know that Beth Alcazar wears a lot of hats within the firearms industry, but this new addition to her USCCA position may be her favorite yet. You know, it wasn't too long ago that I was excitedly looking over some women's gun magazines. That's right, magazines about guns created for women. Unfortunately, I was not too happy with what I saw. Now, I don't mean to be overly critical here, but there were a few photos that stood out to me as exactly why women's gun magazines are not reaching their targets effectively. For example, one image portrayed a bikini-clad woman draped over the front of a boat with a firearm tucked precariously into her bathing suit bottoms. The range safety officer in me was instantly unhappy with the lack of safety or with the blatant disregard for safety rules. Guns aren't toys, nor are they objects of seduction. And honestly, if anything should be tucked in there, it should be a pair of sunglasses or perhaps some sunscreen, not a firearm. The responsible gun owner in me got aggravated that this woman was most certainly not following the guidelines for a proper holster. The trigger and trigger guard were not properly covered, to say the least. And I guarantee that the moment this lady stands up, the gun will tumble right out of those spandex strings. Then finally, the woman in me simply cringed. What was this photo trying to share about gun owners? Or about women? And more importantly, what was this photo actually saying? whether intended or not. The other photo that immediately grabbed my attention was an image of a young woman with an AR-15. With eye and ear protection on and properly seated at a bench, you could tell that she was clearly set up for some target shooting at the range. But, interestingly enough, there was no magazine in the firearm. Oversight? Precaution? All I know is that it's very odd for anyone to be shooting without ammunition. Now, perhaps these frustrations and annoyances are part of why I have supported, pushed for, and practically begged that women have a stronger voice in the firearms publication world. And they may even be more reason why I am beyond excited that USCCA's award-winning Concealed Carry magazine is launching a brand new quarterly women's section. Set to launch in our upcoming January 2017 issue, this section 
will feature 26 new pages of columns, articles, authors, and contributors with the overriding goals to present relevant and relatable information to the fastest demographic in the firearms industry, to provide an informative and welcoming place for building a stronger female voice within the USCCA community, and to empower women to take control of their own and their families' safety. Some of the new content in this women-centric section will include expert training tips, industry trends, practical and tactical information for all experience levels, and a department dedicated entirely to girl gear. As we all know, guys and gals, we're very different in our thoughts, our needs, our bodies, our clothing. And of course, we're going to have some brand new recurring columns that offer fun statistics and details related to the world of firearms, along with powerful real-life experiences and inspirational stories from women. And of course, I have the honor and privilege of working with an amazing, fantastic content and design team to help make all of this happen. Now, even though there have been a host of wonderful female authors and contributors in the magazine over the years, I honestly believe that this dedicated section is a long time coming. And while I certainly believe that all of our readers will enjoy the additional pages, what's really spectacular to me is that I believe we now have a brand new way to connect with women who may not have ever picked up a copy of this magazine or any gun magazine for that matter. We also have a brand new vehicle for sharing safe, and responsible gun ownership at the range, at the lake, or wherever you happen to be. I hope everyone is as excited about this as I am. I really do think this is going to be a great opportunity to reach women and let women's voices become even more strong. And if you want in on this new women's section and you're not currently a subscriber to Concealed Carry Magazine, you have until December 12th at midnight to sign up to have this very first inaugural issue in your hands. Thanks so much for letting me share this really exciting news with you. Stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the donate or the subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly and a little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. Four suspect nabbed in NC home invasion that killed a dad and an intruder. Dateline Bladen County, North Carolina. The last suspect wanted in connection to a deadly home invasion in Bladen County two weeks ago is now in custody. According to officials, Suspect 1, 35, was arrested by U.S. Marshals at a relative's home in Las Vegas Monday afternoon. Suspect 1, along with Suspect 2, 30, Suspect 3, 29, and Suspect 4, 37, are accused of killing victim during a home invasion in the Buckhead community on October 15. Deputies also found two women and three minors hiding in the residence. They were not injured in the home invasion. A fifth suspect, Suspect 5, 38, was injured during the incident and dropped off at the emergency room entrance at Columbus County Regional Hospital in Whiteville. Suspect 5 eventually died from his injuries. Bladen County officials said the suspects all conspired to rob victim at his home. During the armed robbery, several shots were fired and both Suspect 5 and victim were struck. Victim died at the scene, officials said. Victim leaves behind a daughter, according to his obituary. Wow, that sucks. Uh, Really, the only good thing about it, as far as I'm concerned, is that one of the bad guys died as a result. I I wish there had been more bad guy injuries. Yeah, but five on one with two women and three minors cowering in the corner someplace. I mean, that's really bad odds. You're pretty much going to lose that fight. Yeah. You figure five people coming through your door, they're probably not collecting for Christian relief. Random, whimsically armed barbershop quintet? Yeah. Suspect 1, simple assault affray, misdemeanor, class 2. Assault on a female, misdemeanor, class A1. Possession schedule 2, felon, class I. And 3 counts, assault with a deadly weapon, inflicting serious injury, felon, class E. Suspect 2, wanton injury to personal property, $200 or less, misdemeanor, class 1. Suspect 3, larceny, misdemeanor, class 1. Suspect 4, DWI, level 1, misdemeanor, non-class code. Resisting officer, misdemeanor, class 2. Communicating Threats, Misdemeanor Class 1. 
driving under the influence, misdemeanor class 1, larceny, misdemeanor class 1, and larceny from a person, felon, class H. Sean, what's the difference between regular old larceny and larceny from a person? Well, you would think that larceny from a person is robbery, right? Like, because you're taken from a person, usually there's like an element of force in that, and that's robbery, right? Right. Larceny is when you steal from a property, right? It's a, not a violent crime. So if I go in to, say, a, you know, a liquor store or something, and I like shoplift, that's larceny. If I steal from a person and it's a violent crime, it's robbery. Well, what if I just pickpocket the guy? Well, there you go. Right? He doesn't know he's under attack. I'm not using violence to take from him. If I threaten the guy, that's common law robbery. If I use a weapon, that's robbery with a dangerous weapon. But if I just sneak up on him and pull something out of his pocket, that's larceny from a person. And legally in North Carolina, anytime you commit larceny from a person or larceny of a firearm, and I think there's like one other category of larceny, it's automatically up to a felony. And then, of course, we have the victim. Two counts possess Schedule 6, misdemeanor class 1. Three counts driver's license revoked, misdemeanor class 1. Drug paraphernalia use possess, misdemeanor class 1. Possessing stolen goods, misdemeanor class 1. Common law robbery, felon class G. And armed robbery, felon class D. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure why it's listed as armed robbery, felon class D, rather than robbery with a dangerous weapon, which is what it's actually called in North Carolina. So I can't help you there. Hmm. Baron is on assignment and will return next week. So the main topic segment is the Taunton Mall shooting. So Aaron, have I ever told you that guns sometimes cause arguments between the wife and I? Oh, so you mean like 9mm versus 45 ACP or appendix carry versus strong side carry? No, not, not, not arguments like that. Check out this article I found on officer.com. Dateline Taunton, Massachusetts. The Plymouth County Deputy Sheriff who fatally shot a knife-wielding man terrorizing Taunton's Silver City Galleria last spring says he had never fired his gun before in the line of duty until that terrible night. Your body kind of takes over and you do what you're trained to do, says K-9 officer James Creed. Creed was off duty the evening of May 10 and was out to dinner at Bertucci's restaurant with his wife Laura, a registered nurse, when suspect went on a rampage. Bristol District Attorney Thomas M. Quinn concluded Creed was, quote, clearly justified in using deadly force, unquote, in taking down suspect, 28, who had already stabbed to death Patricia Slavin, 80, and critically wounded her daughter Kathleen Slavin before driving to the mall where he would take the life of a second complete stranger. It's still very difficult, Creed said in a quiet voice. It's something that's going to be with us forever. Okay, so that's, that's a terrible story, but how does that relate to causing an argument between you and your wife? Well, what got to me was this audio clip from the attached video. We've talked about... You know, if something happens, you know, he helps and I run, but sorry, but I wasn't leaving anywhere without him. The voice you heard was the deputy's wife. He was out to dinner with his wife in a Bertucci's restaurant, and he talks in a different interview where he always sits with his back to a wall where he can see, you know, the entire restaurant, that sort of thing. The sort of stuff that, frankly, I do. And pretty much Mm -hmm. everybody listening to this podcast annoys the piss out of his wife or his girlfriend or, you know, the ladies probably due to their boyfriends or husbands. You know, if you carry a gun, if you're, you know, if you're a couple who both of you carry the gun, you fight for who gets to sit with their back to the wall. Those things that you do and you, you, you sit there and you watch and when something happened, they had a plan. He was going to stand up and fight. He was the cop. He fights. She runs. And she didn't. So I hear this on a Saturday morning early, right? I get up in the morning. I walk the dog. I come and I sit down. I hit Facebook. I see this story because the report had just been released. The news stories had hit the wire like the night before or something like on a Friday night. So it's all out that morning. And I, I see it in a couple of places on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, listen to this. I hear this clip. And when my wife gets up, it's all I've been thinking about for like an hour or two. And I'm thinking, what's my wife going to do if I ever have to haul out a gun and shoot somebody? I mean, I I need to make a plan right now. And for some reason, she's not really interested in having this discussion on no notice three minutes after she gets out of bed on a Saturday morning. Imagine that. Yeah, I don't know. See, there's a couple of problems, though. 
I'm not always sure exactly what I'm going to do in these situations. In this particular case, the situation was this guy had gone on a rampage. He killed a couple of people. He rolls into a Bertucci's restaurant, right? So I'm safe, right? I would never set foot into Bertucci's. <laughs> Let's say it's the local Mexican restaurant I eat at. But he rolls into this Bertucci's. He's unarmed. There's a waitress there, and he grabs the steak knife off of the tray that the waitress is holding and tries to stab her. Well, right next to this waitress, there's this guy, Mr. Heath, apparently a school teacher. I think he's in his 60s, jumps up and like grabs him and tries to push him away from the waitress, try to protect the waitress. The suspect takes the steak knife and stabs Mr. Heath in the head, ultimately killing the guy. Um, he wasn't dead immediately, right? The police officer stands up, pulls his badge out, throws it. It's on a chain, right? Throws it around his neck, pulls out his gun, identifies himself as a police officer. And what happens, you know, of course, at this point, now the guy's like, oh, look, a cop. I'm going to focus on him. Goes to charge the guy, says, we're both going to die tonight. And, you know, the deputy shoots him. I believe the story is he shoots one time and drops the guy dead. Like one shot, boom, drops the guy. Sounds like a good shoot to me. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get any more clean than that. Yeah. But the wife didn't leave. She's supposed to run away. That was the, that was the plan. But she's a nurse. And what's she do? She runs in. She starts providing medical care immediately to the injured waitress, the mortally wounded Mr. Heath, trying to calm down Mrs. Heath, who, you know, I don't know. They didn't give a whole lot of details over what she did, medically speaking, but she's a nurse. She's doing her thing. I encourage you to go and check the the links. There's there's several links in the show notes and watch the press conference. There's little bits and pieces in the video and look at these people. They're they look mid 20s. I mean, she's like 24 years old. She's I mean, like they look from my perspective, look at kids. She's (laughs) a young nurse and in the middle of, you know, right after a gun battle and a well, not much of a battle, but shoots a guy and, and guy's been stabbing somebody. There's blood probably everywhere. And She's trying to keep people alive. And I'm, all I'm thinking is, well, what the hell's my wife going to do? You know, have I prepared her properly? What's your wife going to do? I mean, Aaron, you're in a different situation, mm-hmm. but you have parents. What are they going to do? Probably freeze. Yeah. What, what are the three options? Fight, flight, or freeze, right? Yeah. Yeah. But just based upon what I have seen from them I mean, they've never been in a situation like this, but just the way they react to surprises, and also they're both getting old. I mean, Dad's 80, and he's got Parkinson's, so he's having trouble thinking. So yeah, I think the natural reaction from both of them will be to just stand there in disbelief and try to figure out what's going on. And so that's just how I assume they're going to react, and I can't really tell them what to do, but I can sort of tailor my reaction based on what I think they will do. And the other part is based upon what I see is going on. I mean, I don't, I don't even have a plan. I have a good idea. Right. And of course, that's going to change within like the first second or two. I don't spend a lot of time in public if I'm not at work, right? And I've said a couple of times on the podcast, and so for the new people, really, not for the people who've been around for a while, I don't tell people what I do specifically generally what I do is I work for a large insurance company where I travel from job site to job site and I do inspections. I'm not going to tell you more than that. I'm in public a lot. I have to follow rules. Those rules are kind of strict about what I can be carrying. I don't spend a lot of time in public otherwise. When I am in public, you bet I'm carrying a gun. So if I'm out with my wife, uh, maybe we're out in a restaurant. Maybe we're out in a supermarket. If I happen to be doing that sort of shopping stuff with the wife, she feels like, I don't feel like driving. Will you take me to? Usually she does that by herself. She doesn't take me with her. But every once in a while, she'd be like, I don't feel like driving. Will you go to the store with me? Okay, sure. So I've got this picture in my head. You know, I guess we all have that picture in our head of, when something bad is going to happen. And it probably won't look like that. I mean, like, it'll be something stupid. You know, we got that gas station picture. We got that supermarket picture. We've got that restaurant picture. You know, the ATM picture. I don't have an ATM picture because I don't go to ATMs except in my car. 
Yeah, there's no way my reactions are going to be anywhere near as badass as how I play them out in my mind. I I know that. <laughs> yeah, the, the ATM picture is I'm in my car. The car is always in gear and, you know, foot on the brake. And you know what? I pity the fool who screws with me at the ATM because I'm just going to run him over or drive away. You know, <laughs> take it. Whatever. Yeah. I don't care. I'm out. Bye. Because do you have any idea what kind of foot pounds of energy a Toyota with the gas pedal fully depressed is pretty freaking high. Oh, it's got to be at least as good as a 45. <laughs> Way better than that. I'm, I am sure of this. But, you know, you look for the exits. And it's the, a couple of things that I've, I've stressed to the wife. If something bad happens, you know there's a back exit to everything. Kitchens. Look for the kitchen exit. Go for the kitchen. Go through the kitchen. Go out the back door. Find the car, get in the car, drive away. Always have your keys to the car. Always have your keys with you. Go home. If I'm not right behind you, get in the car and go home. Don't come back until I call you. If I stay and fight, fine. If, I, if I'm right behind you, great. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm going to stay and fight. Maybe I'm going to be right behind you. I don't know. We'll figure that out when it happens. But go out the back door. Don't go out the front door. Don't go out the door. Bad people are coming in. Just go straight, like in the supermarket, go through the stock room, go out the back door. Because which door are they going to come in? People coming to do bad things are going to come in the front door. They're not going to come through the stock room. Yeah. They're going to come right through the big old sliding doors in the front. So go out the back, run. Well, what if she doesn't? What if I turn to face the threat thinking I'm being Billy Badass, basically, and she doesn't leave because she does what this nurse did. And maybe I make the shot. Maybe I win. And now I'm standing there and I turn around and look and in the confusion, dude missed me, but she caught a bullet because she stood next to me. You know? Yeah. You know, what happens? What, what do bad marksmen do? They shoot low and left? Right-handed bad marksmen shoot low and left? So my wife catches one in the belly? Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you're just single, all by yourself, wandering about, and you get yourself shot, well, you know, your parents get a letter, maybe a flag or something. And that's sad and all. I mean, nobody wants that for their parents, but, I mean, you know, <laughs> it kind of sucks, but it's not so bad. If you're married and you get your butt shot off, then your spouse not only loses you, but if you were gainfully employed, well, now she loses all that money you were bringing in. And one suspects she probably likes you, because if she didn't, she'd have booted your butt out all along before this, because all the crap you pull, she has to like you or she wouldn't put up with it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if there are kids in the mix, that complicates things even more. God help you if there's kids. So all of that, obviously all of that's important. So if she's willing to put up with you or, you know, ladies... They're carrying guns. You need to think of these things too. Probably, quite frankly, you've thought of this way ahead of me. So I'm probably not having to tell you this. But if you're a guy like me, you know, this might be the first time you've thought of this because not too long ago is the first time I've been thinking of this. If your spouse loses you, well, what else is she losing? What are you, what are you taking away from her? You're going to be a hero. And what are, you, what are you stealing from her? What is your ego costing her? Not only are you going to get your butt shot off, but you're taking... Your paycheck, you're taking the emotional, financial, all that support right with you. So, I mean, it's not you that's paying. You're dead. The heck do you care? And now she's with you. She's standing next to you. And maybe your stupid decision gets her butt shot off too. Or worse, just her butt shot. So now you're standing there. You're like, yeah, I won the gun battle. And you turn to look and, you know, give your wife a high five. Hey, look at me. Aren't I great? You're waiting for your little ticker tape parade and keys to the city. Some flash bulbs to start popping so you can give your little interview. Hey, ain't I great? Everybody look at me. And there's your wife bleeding out on the floor. Or your kids. Not so funny anymore. And maybe you did everything you could to prepare your wife. Or your husband or your kids. Yeah, see, this is one of those things which it's definitely worth thinking about and discussing it with your family, but... There are, unfortunately, there aren't any good answers. There aren't even any correct answers here because everything is variable. Yeah. I mean, 
okay, in all the scenarios you've described, it sounds like running away is the much better option. Okay, great, but maybe running away gets you both shot in the back. Maybe. If you're in a situation where you're dead, you may as well fight. If you're in a situation where you're mm-hmm. fishing a barrel, then you fight. No kidding. You know, if you're, if you're dead, fight. Take them with you. If living with what you've left behind is worse than getting shot, are you going to run away knowing that you've left some little kid to get murdered and you're going to have to live with that? Maybe you're going to have to take your chances. But be smart about it. I mean, know what you're risking. You're not just risking yourself. It's not just you out there. There are a lot of other people involved. And it's not just like, you know, the anti-gunner say, oh, what if your bullet might hit somebody else? You can get training and mitigate that problem. And I understand it's your life. You can lose it however you like. As far as I'm concerned, if you want to find a tall building and jump off of it, as long as you don't land on somebody, that's your business. But there are other people involved. If you're leaving a wife, kids, husband, all those other people behind, you better be damn sure that what you are spending your life on is worth it. And it needs to be worth it, not just to you, but to the people you're leaving behind. And if you're spending their life on it, you need to think long and hard before you do it. Definitely a conversation worth having with your spouse, with your kids. Tiffany likes to carry on her waist whenever possible, but it's unrealistic to expect to conceal a firearm at the waistline at all times, especially for women wearing dresses or other clothing that complicates concealed carry. Tiffany recently ordered a calf carry holster from Bug Bite Holsters, and she's here to tell us all about it. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Till you climb inside of his skin walk around in it. Hey, Sean. Hey, Aaron. Hope you guys have had a wonderful week and you're getting off to a great start for the new week to come. I have started on a high note because I went to my front door, opened it up and found on the front porch a package that had been delivered. I ordered some gear a while back and it's finally arrived. So you know what that means. Yep, super happy to try, test, and talk about gear. So first of all, let me just be clear that I am not a gear expert by any means. I'm just a lay person who tries different gear to try and maximize the comfort and security with which I can conceal my equipment. So I'm always open to new things. And I like to tell especially new shooters to be leery of the boxes that oftentimes instructors try to trap you in, right? A lot of, especially the more macho instructors who've been doing this for 60 years, they will tell you, oh, well, the only way to carry is strong side hip. And I tend to agree that strong side hip is the best way to carry, although appendix is is getting really popular now too. I haven't quite jumped on the appendix train yet, but as soon as I can get somebody like Spencer Keepers or somebody who's really knowledgeable in appendix carry to give me a bit of training on that, I would be open to appendix carry. But so far, I haven't done it. I'm still doing strong side hip, but especially as a woman, I'm not always wearing clothing that is especially conducive to strong side hip carry. So I need alternatives. And anybody, ladies out there, especially guys too, but ladies in particular, anybody who tells you, oh, there's only one way to carry, that's bullshit. So just kind of give that person a really polite smile and nod agreeably and then take advantage of the first opportunity to scoot on to another area of town. Okay, what did I order? I was skimming through the November issue of one of the NRA magazines. I think it was I think it was America's First Freedom. And one of the advertisements in there was for this thing called the Bug Bite Holster. B-U-G-B-I-T-E. 
And again, as I said, I, I am not an official product reviewer. I don't know these people. I've never talked to them. They have not asked me to review their product. I'm just sharing with you some of the things that I am learning along the way in case you're interested. So I was curious, the Bug Bite holster is a slip-on lightweight neoprene sleeve, if you will, that you pull up over your foot and ankle and onto your calf. It's kind of like calf carry, like inside the calf carry kind of thing. Sort of, I guess, the the happy median between thigh holsters and ankle holsters, <laughs> I guess, if there is such a thing. But at any rate, it's a it's like a it's like a footless tube sock, kinda. But it's made out of neoprene, you know, that stretchy kind of diver suit type material. And it's got a little zipper on the outside so that you can open up the bottom part and easily comfortably slip your foot through and pull it up onto your calf. What I was interested in, what I really liked about this is that it is, it does seem to be really um, meticulously contoured to the shape of your calf. The top of it is a little bit narrower so that you get that extra security and it, it didn't look like it would slide down my calf because it comes up just high enough to get over the curve in your calf just below the knee so that you have that extra um, circumference in the in the meatiest part of your calf to hold the thing up. So I was really excited about that because of course thigh holsters slide down and I really like my ankle holster when I have to carry on my ankle. That one's pretty secure. I'm carrying in a DeSantis ankle holster, but it's not always ideal when I'm wearing really slight shoes like flats or um, little ballet slippers or something like that. I'm afraid that it will, that my ankle holster will slide down and my muzzle will scrape the ground. (laughs) So we don't want that to happen. And also, of course, ankle holsters don't do anything for a, for when you're wearing a dress, right? So I am still in desperate search of an, of of a solution to carrying while wearing a dress. Yes, I know you can carry in your purse. I am one of those women who, while I'm not prepared to say you should never carry in your purse, I am one of those folks who says, Avoid it whenever you possibly can. Um, Just because I I know myself and I'm absent-minded enough to get up and walk off without my purse or not to leave it somewhere unattended, but you know, I might get up and walk to a vending machine or something and leave my purse 10 feet away from me. And to me, that's irresponsible. Um, If you're gonna have a firearm on you, then it should be in your absolute control at all times. And so that's just one shortcoming that I'm willing to admit about myself that makes me a less than ideal candidate for purse carry. So I can't speak for everybody, but I personally am trying to stay away from purse carry. I will say though, however, for anybody who is interested in purse carry, if you're going to do that, make sure you do get an actual gun purse or you purchase some kind of holster or an insert that's meant to hold a gun in a purse. But what you don't want to do is just grab your gun, throw it in your purse so that your lipstick or your pen or something else can get entangled in the trigger guard and, and, and make loud noises and cause bad things to happen. Okay, getting back to this bug bite holster. So I got it in the mail. I was impressed with the speed of delivery. It came in a couple of days. I went to their website. They don't appear to sell any other items, just this one. Um, Ordering was easy. There was a really, really thorough um, tracking system. I think they delivered through UPS and it was real easy to track my shipment. But it came in a couple of days. I'm holding it in my hand right now. Very comfortable. I wore it around the house for a day with nothing in it. Um, which is how I usually test out new holsters. And then I wore it around the house for a few hours with an empty firearm in it. Now, the website says very clearly that this is meant only for smaller firearms. I think I've mentioned on, on this segment before that, you know, I prefer to carry a Glock 17 or at least one Glock 17, if not two, um, wherever I can get away with it, both legally and practically in terms of what I'm wearing. But sometimes you can't accommodate that size firearm. So I might downsize to a Glock 19 if I need to with my clothing, or I might, if I have to, even drop down to a Glock 43. 
And according to the Bug Bite website, this neoprene calf sleeve, this holster, will accommodate a Glock 43. The picture, the image on the, the advertisement looks like it's one of those little nano Kimbers. It's a little mini um, micro 1911, but I don't think there's a magazine in it on the picture, which gives a bit of a false impression that, <laughs> that, the, that the firearm is being better accommodated than it actually would be. Um, so that's, that's one red flag. But that's the image on the little on the cover at on the cover art. When I flipped through the website a little bit, they had another image. They have a page that explains what guns are compatible with this holster. And the main firearm that was pictured there was a Glock 43. So I was like, okay, great. Surely it'll work with my 43. So as I said, after wearing it for a while empty, um, it was really comfortable. And I tried it with um, with an empty firearm in the holster. And, you know, my excitement started to wane a little bit, to be honest. My calves are really round and, you know, <laughs> sort of bulky, I guess. I don't have stick legs. My legs are really, really curvy. My calves are. And so that caused the butt of the gun to kind of jut out from my leg. And it caused, when I wore this under slacks, it caused a bit of tinting as I walked. Um, there was some pretty obvious printing on my calf. So that was disappointing. It didn't, it didn't hold the firearm flush against the side of my leg. Now, I hasten to say that could just be a function of the fact that my legs are so chunky, right? If your legs are more slender, more streamlined, then this may actually work for you. Another cool thing about it is on the opposite side from the holster, it has a little magazine pouch. And that magazine pouch fit perfectly my little six round magazine for the Glock 43. But the holster pocket itself, the sleeve where the firearm actually goes, it's kind of, it's, it has a lot of the drawbacks of most kind of, most holsters that are designed as one size fits all, as opposed to a holster that's molded specifically to the, the make and model firearm that you have. It's not an ideal fit. It's the opening is a, is a bit awkward. It's, it's sewn closed at the very top, at the true top. And then the opening is sort of along a diagonal from the top to the back. So I can see it being, it, it was difficult to get a reliable purchase on the grips of the firearm. I couldn't establish a firing grip. So if I were to carry this way, I would expect an extremely slow deployment and I would have to be extremely careful about establishing a reliable grip before I retrieved the firearm from the holster. So speed would definitely be a serious issue. However, as I always say, when I'm having to resort to less than ideal holsters, having um, a gun at all is better than having none whatsoever. So I'm pretty sure that this bug bite holster would not work for me in slacks. So I still haven't quite solved my situation when I'm wearing dress shoes of some kind that, that won't hold up my ankle holster. But it's possible that it could work if I were really desperate um, under a long skirt, an ankle length skirt. Obviously, it couldn't work for a shorter skirt because it goes on your calf. So I don't know. I, I guess this, I'm going to keep it, not going to return it. It was 40 bucks. You know, we'll see. Uh, I honestly don't expect that I'll be using this anytime soon. Uh, it's kind of an interesting idea. And, you know, maybe I'll do with this what I did with my belly band and take it to a seamstress and start kind of doctoring on it a little bit. I don't know. If I do that, I'll keep you guys posted. But bug bite holsters, eh, it's, it's, it's kind of luke, lukewarm in my, in my eyes so far. All right, that's my review. I'm doing my air quotes now because <laughs> I'm not really a reviewer. But for anybody who's interested in what the heck I've got to say about holsters, that's that on that. Okay, I hope it's helpful to somebody. If you want to know more about this thing, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to, to send you some pictures or, or give you more information. That's it for me this week. Stay safe, keep it centered and even. And since I caught y'all jamming to Pharrell earlier, I know you want a little more Pharrell. So we just ride out to Pharrell and I'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs>
You can follow Tiffany at FrontSightPress.com. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron Paulette. Come on, every pony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Aaron Paulette! So I was watching YouTube videos about The Walking Dead, you know, like you do if you're a fan of the show, and I happened across a video titled The Walking Dead's Silent Killer which asked a great question. How do these hardened survivors manage to let moaning, shuffling zombies sneak up on them? And the answer was pretty simple. The survivors are going deaf because they are shooting guns, often in enclosed spaces, without sufficient hearing protection. And because they're going deaf, this explains why Rick seems to yell so dang much. And so, like most things related to the zombie apocalypse, this got me thinking about prepping, and I realized that hearing protection during an emergency is something that isn't talked about very often. So in this segment, I'm going to talk about how average preppers can protect their senses in a disaster. Now first, sight. Your eyesight is the most important sense because it's how humans process most of our data, and so it's very important that we protect it. Unfortunately, given the size and shape of the eyes, it's not very easy to carry dedicated protection for them in the same way that you can carry earplugs. On the plus side, you probably have eye protection around you without realizing it. For example, if you wear glasses, you have eye protection. Of course, they are very expensive eye protection, and if they break, you're in a mess of trouble, but glasses can be replaced while eyes can't. And if you wear glasses all the time, you really ought to spring for protective options like shatterproof lenses, anti-scratch coatings, and the like to extend their usefulness. But if you don't wear glasses, odds are really good that you have a pair of sunglasses nearby. And while these aren't great in many situations due to their polarization, subpar eye protection is better than no eye protection at all. But if you want really good protection, I recommend going down to your local hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's and looking in the protective gear aisle. There, you can find protective lenses in both clear, tinted, and polarized colors. Some of them even look like stylish sunglasses. You can get a nice pair for around $20 to $30 that are rated against a lot of construction-style hazards, unlike your typical shooting glasses. And while you're there, check out some of the goggles that protect your eyes from debris. While they aren't really suitable for everyday carry, stash a pair at work or in your get-home bag, just in case you have to evacuate from an emergency with the wind blowing harmful particulates or irritating vapors. And the best part about these is that they will fit over glasses, so that way we four-eyed folk can protect the things that help us see. Now speaking of goggles, another great option, although one that's going to get you some side eyes, is to get a set of clear swim goggles. These are small, they protect your eyes from vapors and liquids as well as debris, although they aren't as strong as actual safety glasses, and there are some brands, like the Speedo Optical Swim Goggle, that can be bought with lenses that have negative diopters from negative 1.5 to negative 8. So even if you wear glasses, you can put on these goggles and see somewhat in an emergency. Now next, hearing. Compared to eyesight, Preppers have an embarrassment of choices when it comes to ways to protect our ears. It's very easy to stick a set of disposable foam earplugs into your EDC gear, and if you haven't done this, you need to do so right now. But if you want better options than cheap foam, you certainly have them. My earplug of choice is the Surefire 4 Sonic Defender, which has a filter that allows you to hear low sounds like conversation while also blocking out louder noises. And if you seal the filter on them, they have a noise reduction rating of 24 decibels. What's more, they fit snugly inside the ear, allowing you to wear them with helmets. Or you can put earmuffs over them if you're sensitive to noise and need to double plug. Best of all, they're inexpensive. You can get them from Amazon for $13.50 or less. And finally, the sense of smell. And protecting your sense of smell isn't so much the important thing. The important part is protecting your lungs because anything which could damage your nose like that will also wreak havoc on your respiratory system. Much like eye protection, this is another one of those easy yet hard things, because the best forms of filters are bulky and not the kind of thing you'd carry on a daily basis. On the other hand, there are many things you can improvise into an air filter in an emergency. Towels, handkerchiefs, and even socks and t-shirts can be held over your nose and mouth, and if you can moisten them, so much the better. 
but a good non-improvised solution is a set of filtered nose plugs. Yes, I know how silly that sounds, and no, I'm being completely serious here. There's a brand of nasal filters made by a company called Woody Nose, that's K-N-O-W-S, that protects against volatile organic compounds, secondhand smoke, car exhaust, etc. And when you buy the box, you get three filter frames and six pairs of filters. So basically, a filter set and a spare for each unit. And this only costs $19 on Amazon. Carry a set with you, put a set in your get-home bag, and keep the third in reserve or give it to someone you love. So there you go. Affordable and easy-to-carry ways to protect your senses in emergencies by plugging your ears and nose and covering your eyes. Not only can you subscribe or donate to the podcast, you can also make a contribution to the LGBT Training Ammo Fund. Go to GunBlogVarietyCast.com and click on the LGBT Training Ammo Fund donation button in the right sidebar. I'll use this money to pay for range fees, targets, and yes, ammo for the people I teach. And thanks for your support. After the election, the antis are checking the damage. Some are pretty rational, and others are completely nuts. In This, this week, week in, in Anti-Gun, anti-gun nuttery. nuttery. So hey, Weird, what do you got for me this week? So this week will be the first in ages where I don't have any audio to fisk. I really wanted to talk about the election results. But on the anti-gun side, you could really hear a pin drop. I did manage to find a hilarious article by Mike, the gun guy, Weiser. You'll remember Mike from episode 109. He's a self-professed gun nut, and despite that chosen accolade and the fact that he owns a gun shop here in Massachusetts, Mike really doesn't know much about guns, and hasn't met a gun law or a gun banner he doesn't like. He was a huge Hillary supporter, and in his disappointment, he penned an article both on the Huffington Post and his blog. Hey Sean, would you mind reading the quote? I don't know if I can do his voice, but... I'll read what he wrote. Where I am going with these numbers is to try and judge the impact of the gun vote on the outcome as a whole. Because from the very beginning of this campaign, guns and gun violence played a central role in how these two candidates presented themselves, both to those who ended up voting, as well as to the substantial numbers who didn't bother to vote. Hillary kickstarted her primary battle against Bernie in a take-no-prisoner statement after the shooting at Umpqua Community College. And Trump never stopped reminding his audience that he was NRA's official candidate almost before his campaign began. This was a very interesting election for the Second Amendment, because it was the first time, possibly ever, where one candidate was openly campaigning for gun bans and restrictions on the Second Amendment. Also speaking out, though not as openly, against the Supreme Court ruling that declared those campaign promises illegal. While the other side was openly campaigning for the Second Amendment, and not just gun culture 1.0 talking points about shooting ducks and deer and pieces of paper, but openly courting people who own guns for personal protection and defense against tyranny. Weiser goes on. Now the fact the NRA ran television spots in gun-rich states like Georgia, Texas, and Tennessee probably didn't affect the results in those states at all. A majority of residents in those states, wishful thinking to the contrary, will always vote for the GOP. And they didn't need the NRA to remind them that no matter who sits atop the National Democratic ticket, that individual represents a threat to their guns. But they might need the NRA to remind them that they have Trump's ear. And pro-gun voters staying home was exactly what got President Obama elected for his second term. The NRA is already taking credit for getting their man into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But the overall, but the overall, and most statewide numbers belie their claim. What cooked the Clinton goose was not the turnout for Trump. It was the fact that she was unable to retain voting strength that the bomber demonstrated in 2008 and 2012. First up, for whatever reason, he's referencing President Obama as the bomber. I did a quick Google search to see where he got that nickname from, because I'd never heard anybody call him that before. Googling Barack Obama and the bomber will result in Bill Ayers. I don't think that's what he meant. Certainly, Clinton was wildly unpopular both nationwide and with her own voting base. But you can't see all the rallies, as well as the sound beating Trump gave to a wide GOP field from a diverse, and I would personally add, better suited primary contenders, and say that he wasn't personally motivating people. As you probably know, I'm not a Donald Trump fan, and as a Massachusetts resident, I had nothing to gain for voting for him, so I chose not to vote for him. Still, now that he's our president-elect, I'm cautiously optimistic, and quite glad Secretary Clinton was handed her walking papers. While Clinton was actively and openly hostile to the Second Amendment, Donald Trump actively courted the gun vote, 
and didn't shy away from embracing topics like self-defense, concealed carry, and possession of so-called assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. While I'm deeply troubled by some of the statements he's made, specifically the ones that I've outlined in episode 112 where I covered the presidential debate, I'm heartened that Mr. Trump is a longtime holder of a New York City concealed carry permit and is openly admitted to owning a Smith & Wesson 38 revolver and a 45 ACP H&K pistol, two guns that are generally considered ideal for personal protection and home defense, more than the common hunting and sporting rifles and shotguns gun-friendly politicians have talked about in the past. It does also appear that Donald Trump is still in communication with the NRA as well as other bona fide Second Amendment supporters after clinching the victory. I may not like the man, but that doesn't mean he can't do the job I want him to, and he certainly appears to be capable of doing so. But now let's get away from Trump and talk about what I thought was really exciting. Back to Mike's anti-gun piece. Three states passed significant ballot initiatives, banning high-cap magazines in California, extending background checks to private sales in Nevada, and temporarily blocking high-risk individuals from accessing firearms in Washington state. First up, California is a state full of anti-gun nuts. They have every crazy anti-gun law they want, and they have a horrible violent crime problem, and they are always begging for more gun bannery. While California's magazine ban and Washington's total disregard for due process passed with wide margins, both are clear-cut abuses of human rights and will be begging for a Supreme Court ruling. A Supreme Court, I might add, that just might soon be filled with Donald Trump appointees, which is something I also have cautious optimism for. Nevada, on the other hand, passed their background check initiative with the narrowest of margins. It cleared with just a hair over 10,000 votes. What Mike doesn't mention is Maine also had an identical ballot initiative, and despite Maine being a considerably smaller state, it was defeated by a much wider margin. Also, in all these states, Michael Bloomberg, as well as various AstroTurf shell groups, spent millions of dollars getting these initiatives on the ballot and then campaigning for them. Mike Bloomberg is going to have to think about the cost-benefit ratio pushing these measures. The big takeaway from these initiatives is that it unequivocally proves that there is no 80 or 90% majority that supports further gun control restrictions. Even in blue states with large anti-gun populations, there is barely a plurality of gun control support. And in gun-friendly states, there is at best for the antis a deep divide. Also, what Mike Weiser doesn't talk about, but what Mike Bloomberg has sadly admitted in his mouthpiece website, The Trace, NRA-backed candidates overwhelmingly cleaned up in House and Senate races. We certainly can't rest on our laurels. While the GOP is certainly the gun-friendly party compared to the Democrats, they are much to be desired in their apathy to anti-gun measures. When President Trump and his crop of pro-gun legislators are sworn in, we need to get our game in gear, write and call them all to get them to support real common-sense gun laws. Initiatives like concealed carry reciprocity and removing suppressors from the NFA, both of which have bills ready to go, but also things like federal preemption that would force all 50 states to recognize the Heller and McDonald Supreme Court rulings and save those of us who are behind enemy lines in the lands of gun nuttery. And talk about the Supreme Court. Let them know that support for the Second Amendment and the Heller and McDonald rulings are important to you when selecting future justices for the Supreme Court. We got a big victory last week. Let's not squander it. All right, Weird. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Plug of the week. So, Aaron, I understand you have a plug of the week for us. I do. Now, Sean, I remember you saying that you were considering mounting your podcast gear to a piece of plywood for when you go to conventions. Yeah, I thought about it, but I decided it was about 10 pounds of work for about one pound of cool. Basically, I was just too lazy to go to that much trouble. Well, even though you didn't do anything with it, that notion gave me an idea for a solution of my own. You see, I don't advertise this, but I don't usually record at home like Sean does. Instead, I pack my gear up and go to my church where I can record in silence. And with two barking dogs and two hard-of-hearing family members, it can get rather loud at times. And so with all the stuff I need to make a quality recording, it was really annoying to take it all out of my backpack, set it all up, record, then break it all down again and pack it all up. I got tired of that, and so I went in search of a solution. Because really, the mother of invention is laziness as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I found that solution 
with the Gridit organizer. The Gridit is basically a firm board. Mine is 8 by 12 inches, but you can get it in a variety of sizes. You can go as small as 5 by 7 inches and as large as 11 by 15. And it has a selection of elastic straps crisscrossing it, and they go under and above each other, and it's just kind of eclectic. Now, I got mine from Amazon for $14.21 with prime shipping. Larger ones will, of course, cost more. And to use it, you just take stuff you want organized and you stick it under the straps in the position you like and the elastic tension holds it in place. I've attached a picture of my podcast setup so you can see how it works. And this is amazingly useful for me because almost all of my stuff is just already plugged in on the board. All I have to do is take the grid out of my bag, I plug the power strip into the wall, I attach the microphones and headset, and I am ready to go. So if you have a lot of loose stuff that you want to keep organized, or if you're like me and you're lazy and you don't want to keep setting up your podcast gear, get a grid it. You won't regret it. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that the Gun Blog Variety Cast is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 118. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. And if you seal the filter on, <laughs> and if you seal the filter on them, they have a noise reduction rating of 24 decibels. What's more, they f- what's more, they fit snugly in. S- Shut up. What's more, they fit snugly inside the ear, allowing you to wear to- allowing you to wear them with helmets. On the other hand, there are many things you can improvise into an air filter and. Shush. On the other hand, there are many things there. Oh, God. This is a URS production.